Growing up, I loved to solve problems and mysteries just like Sherlock Holmes. I would keep a mental picture of all the clues, the minor inconsistencies, the illogical settings, just to see if I have predicted the finale of those detective stories. It was this love for solving perplexing problems that drove me into a career in clinical research. Today, I would like to share a challenging problem in clinical medicine and see if we could solve it together. The puzzle is cancer. In a lifetime, one in five of us will have a diagnosis of a cancer. And one in 10 of the new cancer diagnoses happen in persons aged between 20 to 44 years. It is worrying that 40% of cancer patients survive for less than five years from the time of diagnosis. Each year, 50 billion US dollars are spent on the development of new ways to treat cancer. Many new sophisticated drugs have emerged. So why aren't we winning the war against cancer? On many occasions, I have helped friends and family to get access to the latest and most promising cancer therapies. There was this friend, Susan. Her father was diagnosed with a form of lung cancer. They heard that there were targeted therapies that could shrink the tumor dramatically. The catch was the drug would only work on tumors with certain gene mutations. So the family approached me to get access to genetic testing. The tumor turned out to be positive for the gene mutations, targeted therapy was started, and the family was rejoicing. A few weeks later, I ran into Susan and her parents at a shopping center not far from here. Susan immediately introduced me to her parents as the doctor who saved them. Susan's mother held my hands. She was weeping while she was smiling. But guess how I felt? I felt terrible. I couldn't look them in their eyes because I knew that the wonder drug would only work for about 12 months. They would then need to move on to another drug, which would give them a few more months until there would be no more drugs. By that stage, they would curse modern medicine for having led them from one treatment failure to another. I've seen it happening all too many times. So how do we turn these sad statistics around? Instead of prolonging life months at a time, can we cure cancer? Maybe the answer is not even in the treatment. Maybe we are diagnosing cancer too late so late that there is no chance of a cure. What if we can diagnose ultra-early cancers? What would that mean? The question is, where do we start? For I, I started by asking questions deeply and not let any of these questions stay unsolved. So after medical school, I decided to further my training in Hong Kong, and I decided to enter diagnostic medicine for my specialty training. This is a field where one gets to read numbers on blood reports and work out what is the underlying illness of the patient. I thought that this was the most ideal problem-solving job for me. But my seniors seemed to know better. Just four months into my six years of training, even before my probation had ended, I was told 
to change jobs. I was told to consider research as a career. I was even handed the precious opportunity to receive research training in a brand new field. At that time, my mentor, he had just discovered for the first time in the world that during pregnancy, the baby would release small amounts of his DNA into the circulation of his mother. This meant that there was the possibility to perform prenatal genetic testing on the unborn child by using the mother's blood sample without harming the baby. I was curious, and I just couldn't let this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to pass. The next few years were transformative. I learned that doing research means one has to be the first to solve any unanswered questions. And to be the first, one has to outsmart other groups in the world, be determined and work efficiently. For example, I still remember the first time that we had to analyze a huge data set, even before our big data compu computer had been installed. We had to get the problem solved overnight because we knew that there was another US group working on exactly the same problem. Not willing to give up, I enlisted the help of 10 team members, and each of us analyzed close to a million data points manually. It was with this level of devotion that we solved one problem after another. And just 10 years after I started my research career, we successfully developed a blood test based on the mother's blood sample to detect if the baby had chromosomal abnormalities, such as Down syndrome. I led the world's first large-scale clinical trial to show that the test is 99% accurate. Today, over 100 countries are using this test, and this has led to substantial reductions in the number of invasive tests um, that has been performed for prenatal diagnosis. Then, there was one day. I was issuing reports for this blood-based um, prenatal test, and I saw a very peculiar set of blood results, where almost half of the 23 pairs of human chromosomes were abnormal. And I thought, the abnormalities were too profound to be coming from the baby. So what could it be? Well, for some years, researchers had known that when a person has cancer, its abnormal DNA would be released into the circulation. So I suspected this pregnant woman had a cancer. What should I do next? This had not happened before. So I discussed the findings with an academic oncologist. She consulted her peers, and then they came back, and then they said, sorry, we could not take on this case because there was no established protocol. Meaning that a prenatal genetic test flagging the possibility of a cancer in the pregnant woman has never happened before. They wouldn't know what to do next. They wouldn't know which organ to start looking. After this case, there were others. Some women terminated pregnancy, received cancer treatment, and survived. Some other women, they died of the cancer while pregnant. So there's got to be something that we could do for these women. What if we had known that there was a cancer hiding somewhere earlier on? Well, cancers are usually hidden and don't come to light until it is too late. And cancers are hidden because right now, we don't go actively look for them. We typically need to wait for a person to feel unwell, for example, coughing up blood, losing a lot of weight, before we start investigations to look for cancers. The current statistics show that this sit-and-wait approach usually leads to diagnosis 
of late-stage cancers. So to turn the statistics around, it means that we have to actively go and find cancers that are hidden. But the question is, which part of the body do we start searching? Well, how about if we use a blood sample? After all, we saw the abnormal cancer DNA in the blood of those unfortunate mothers. In fact, researchers called the use of a blood sample to catch a glimpse of a cancer as a liquid biopsy approach, meaning that a liquid blood sample is almost equivalent to a cancer tissue biopsy. It is just that no one has yet shown that the liquid biopsy approach is sensitive enough to detect early cancers. So, about five years ago, our team launched a study to explore this. The first hurdle that we had to solve is, where do we look for persons with hidden cancers? Well, they'd be in the community, amongst us. This meant that we cannot do the study in hospitals or clinics. We had to move to the community, and we needed large numbers of volunteers. Next, we decided to work on a cancer called nasopharyngeal cancer. This is a cancer that happens in the back of the nose. And there are several reasons why we picked this cancer. Number one, this is a very unusual cancer in that it only targets ethnically southern Chinese. For example, persons from Hong Kong or from the Guangdong province. Another reason we picked this cancer is that it is the number one cancer in young men. Third reason, it is highly treatable by radiotherapy if detected early. But the problem is that right now, most of the cases are diagnosed in late stages. Last reason is that we had already developed a blood DNA test for this cancer. So the only missing component would be participants from the community. So to solicit the help from the community, we went to different forms of media to publicize the study. We were aiming to recruit men because they were at high risk for nasopharyngeal cancer than women. To make it easy for people to participate in the study, we scheduled all the recruitment sessions over the weekends and in community halls. We rotated between all 18 districts of Hong Kong. On the day, we were ready to launch the study. We activated a website for people to register their interests. To our surprise, within hours, the study quota was completely filled. People came from all walks of life. There were men who were health conscious, but there were more who were mobilized by their spouses. We <laughs> We had a lot of participants from the uniform forces, such as the police. Even the district councillors helped. And we even had individuals who flew back to Hong Kong from overseas just to join the study. It has taken us three years, 150 weekends, to finish the blood collection from all the 20,000 registrants. But deep down, actually, we were really worried that we would disappoint the enthusiastic participants because we would not know if the blood test would be successful until the end of it all. These individuals, they joined the study because they had faith in our team. They had faith in the science, and they went out of the way to help. Well, reassuringly, the blood test did pick up nasopharyngeal cancer. But remarkably, the statistics were flipped. The cases detected by the blood test, 70% of them were early stages. So early that the surgeons had difficulty to find the tumor using endoscopy. And we had to use MRI. And some of the cancers were shown to be just two millimeters in diameter. All of these cases were then treated. We tracked them for five years, and the data showed that 
the survival improved 10 times. <laughs> Thank you. The data was celebrated by the international scientific media. So, please imagine what the future would be like if we apply the same to all cancers. And in fact, I'm extending this concept onto liver cancer. Also, we have not forgotten those unfortunate mothers who had a hidden cancer somewhere in the body. We have even developed a blood test that can detect which body organ is releasing the abnormal cancer DNA. It's like doing a CT scan on a blood tube. So, the future is closer than we think. But I and other medical researchers cannot do this alone. We need your participation. I understand that everyone is busy and that usually study participants don't immediately benefit from the study results. But if it wasn't for the large number of volunteers decades ago, today we would not even know that high cholesterol causes heart diseases. So may I please enlist your help to actively seek opportunities to participate in medical research. If you hear of study investigators um, describing their studies on radio or social media, please take the initiative to contact them. If you have been approached to be a study participant, please give some serious thoughts to it. Even if you cannot directly participate, help in other ways. Be a voluntary helper, offer professional help, for example, media outreach or website design. Be aware of the transformation that medical research can bring. Even my future health is in your hands. We can beat cancer, but only if we do it together.